On this rather grey and dismal day, um, welcome, a warm welcome to Book at Lunchtime. And today we'll be discussing Eleanor Parker's book, Conquered, The Last Children of Anglo-Saxon England. So although some of you will have come to Book at Lunchtime before, some of you will be newcomers. And I'd just like to explain, um, as the new Torch director, uh, I can keep saying this for a few more weeks, but then I won't be able to say it anymore, um, that it's one of uh, Torch's longest standing flagship events. Um, and Torch, of course, has been in existence for the past 10 years. And Eleanor actually has been a part of it since then in, in all kinds of ways. Uh, we have a library of um, YouTube videos uh, for every book discussion uh, that we've had uh, going back to 2013. So uh, this, this, this event has a kind of heritage of its own. And we have featured an extraordinary variety and range of books. So the last one we had was on popular music. Today we're doing something completely different and we're going to be talking um, about uh, medieval and early modern history. So today uh, we're privileged to welcome uh, Eleanor Parker, lecturer in medieval English literature at Brasenose College, who has indeed a, a long association with Torch. Uh, as a former Mellon postdoctoral fellow here, when Torch scarcely existed or was only, you know, in its its earliest inception, uh, she's also brilliantly known to many of us by her Twitter handle uh, Clark of Oxford. Um, so she's a very active uh, exer or tw tweeter, basically. Um, and today we're here to discuss Concord. Well, of course, the Norman Conquest uh, is one of the most momentous events in English history, and its consequences changed England forever. Uh, the Battle of Hastings and its aftermath nearly wiped out the leading families of Anglo-Saxon England. So what happened to the children that this conflict left behind? Um, Eleanor's book has garnered some really exceptional reviews. Um, I just quote from a few. The Times, this outstanding, beautifully written history follows the young Anglo-Saxons whose lives were shattered by the Norman Conquest. The Sunday Times, Concord is beautifully produced and written with great flair uh, and scholarly acumen. And I, I was also reading Sarah Foote's um, uh, review in the Church Times, which I, I much liked actually on the elegiac misreading of the titles, Last Children, the last children of Anglo-Saxon England for the lost children, um, and how that title resonates uh, in our current war-torn times, um, a very prescient kind of title, I think. Um, Eleanor is joined by an expert panel who will bring their particular specialisms to bear on the discussion. Uh, Dr. Emily Winkler uh, and Michael, and oh, I'm not good at names now, I should have asked you before. Is it An Angera? An Angera, yeah. And Winkler, Winkler. yes, great. Uh, and so I will hand over to Emily, who will be a chair for our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the introduction, and I am uh, honoured to to be here to host this book book discussion about about Eleanor's book. I will just start by introducing the three of us. You have a sense of our research backgrounds and why why we're all here together to talk about the book. Um, I'll then turn things over to Eleanor to in introduce her her book um, and and read you some some highlights from it. Each of us will then give a bit of a response evolve into discussion and at, at the very end I'll be asking for for questions questions from you we'll bring this to a slightly earlier close um, at, at 150 because le lecturing duties call but please please do feel feel free to to stay and to and to discuss informally afterwards so my my name is is Emily Winkler I'm the lecturer in medieval history here in Oxford at Hartford College and St Edmund Hall. I'm a historian and I'm interested in historical writing in the aftermath of, of the Norman Conquest. I've been working on a, a project about comparing English and Welsh ideas about Britain's Roman past, so I'm very interested in retelling stories over time after conquests. And I've also worked on a project about ideas about grieving in, in, the, in the Middle Ages. So it was, it was with all these things in mind too that I was reading Eleanor's book. I've asked I've asked the the panelists what what question is is driving their their research. Um, Michael is a DPhil candidate in English at Corpus Christi College here in Oxford, working with Dr. Laura Ash. Uh, 
and he's working on the role of multilingualism and the translation of poetry in transforming history writing across the Norman Conquest. So the main question he's thinking about at the moment is how to come up with the theory for understanding the translation and retranslation of the, the, most, the most popular popular book in, uh, in, in, in 12th century England, and some might say the, the medieval world at this time, the history of the Kings of Britain of, of Jeffreys Monmouth. And Dr. Eleanor Parker is, is also a lecturer in English at Brasenose College here in, in Oxford. And she's working on two projects. She's, she's, ed 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 she's editing with a colleague the, the impressive Cambridge history of old Norse Icelandic literature, working with Heather O'Donoghue. You can look for that early next year. And she's now working on a follow-up project to a book that, that came out in 22, uh, Winters in the World, A Journey Through the Anglo-Saxon Year. So um, plenty of Eleanor's books that have come out or that you can look for forthcoming in, in uh, the next few years. And so she's interested in English wisdom poetry. And the question driving her research is how we define wisdom poetry, or indeed, for that matter, wisdom. So. I think I think you'll probably have a sense about the the ways in which we're we're all interested in narrative language and the people who who emerge to us through reading and and imagining um, these medieval works. So I will now turn over to to Eleanor to introduce the book that you're all here to hear about. Thank you, thank you, Emily. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's really lovely to see people here, um, and I, I look forward to hearing your thoughts as well as the thoughts of the panel here. Okay, so I wasn't really sure what to read to introduce the book, um, so I thought, well, why not read from the introduction? That is what it's for. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to read some excerpts from kind of early on in the book and, and set the scene, really. Sometimes events occur which are so sudden and so life-changing in their implications that they alter an entire society. They cleave time in two, life before and life after. They define generations, dividing society into those who remember the world before the new reality and those who have never known anything else. The Norman conquest of England was one of those events. For almost a thousand years, it has been seen as a defining moment in English history, the end of one age and the beginning of another. Sometimes even, despite all evidence to the contrary, the starting point of English history itself. The single date 1066 is deeply embedded in British culture. Almost from the first, it was interpreted as a pivotal moment, a watershed after which nothing would be the same ever again. In recent decades, historians of this period have increasingly tried to push back against some of the ways in which the Norman Conquest has been employed by national myth-making. They've been careful to emphasise what did not change with the Conquest, as well as what did, and also to stress that change did not happen overnight. The Battle of Hastings marked only the beginning of a long process of conquest, rather than a single decisive moment. But no one would disagree that this process resulted in profound and lasting changes to English culture and society, to the English language and to relationships with England's neighbours in the British Isles and further afield. This book explores the lives of those who had a unique perspective on this moment in history, the generation born on the eve of the conquest, who were in their childhood or teens in 1066 and grew up in its aftermath. In most cases too young to have a direct role in the events of that year, but old enough to perceive what was happening. They would find their adult lives shaped by the influence of new forces rapidly altering the world into which they had been born. At the time of the conquest, those in their teens were entering adulthood, old enough to marry, hold lands or fight in battle, but were unlikely to have yet had much experience of leadership or political life, and were still to a large degree dependent on the decisions of their elders or those in authority over them. Others were young children, made vulnerable by the loss of parents or home, and affected by the conquest in ways that would influence them for the rest of their lives. In the years after 1066, as the effects of the conquest took hold, some members of this generation began to play an active part in rebellion against Norman rule, while others chose or were forced into submission. Some left the country, some did little but watch and observe the changes they were witnessing. The effect of the conquest on the lives of this generation of English children was not by any means wholly negative. While some struggled to find a place for themselves in the post-conquest world, others flourished, benefiting from new encounters and opportunities for cultural exchange. But whatever their individual experiences, they all faced lives which turned out very differently from the ones they might have expected to live. Within narrative accounts, both medieval and modern, 
of the development of a mixed Anglo-Norman society in the years after the conquest. The generation who are the focus of this book have often held an uncertain place. They do not quite fit in. Both in the Middle Ages and in the modern era, there has been a fascination with one particular kind of post-conquest survivor, the rebels who fought against Norman rule in the years after 1066. In different areas of the country, the remnants of families who have been powerful before the conquest tried to mount military opposition to the new regime. These re rebellions had some short-lived success, but of course they ultimately ended in failure. Perhaps the doomed nature of the enterprise has retrospectively coloured it with all the more romantic glamour, and novelists as well as historians have long been attracted to the stories of such men. This is exemplified above all by the popularity of the legend of Hereward the Wake, who ever since the 12th century has been the subject of myths about a heroic but futile English resistance. Modern historians have not always been kind to those who led these failed rebellions. Medieval historians were not particularly kind to them either. But even worse in the eyes of some are those among the English who reached an accommodation with the new regime. In the words of Anne Williams, summarising the views of many 19th and 20th century historians, those who cooperated with the invaders have been regarded as quislings and traitors, those who resisted as foolish and incompetent. <laughs> These are easy judgments for historians to make with the benefit of centuries of hindsight. Whether they fought or not, the conquered English cannot win. And of course, not everyone could fight, even if they wanted to. The leaders of these rebellions were almost all young aristocratic men who had the option and the resources to take direct action if they wished. That option was not open to everyone, not to most women or children or those committed to religious life. Some women did in fact involve themselves in the rebellions, but that was far from common. A more indicative sign of how women might have experienced these turbulent post-conquest years is found in the sources which speak of women seeking refuge in religious houses out of fear of sexual violence from the Normans. As time went on, the female members of families which had been powerful before 1066 had to deal with a strange new status. If they had been left vulnerable by the loss of fathers and brothers to the conquest, they had also become the chief surviving representatives of lines of inheritance which held both tangible and intangible value for the conquerors. A war-torn country is a dangerous place for women. The image on the cover of this book um, is taken from the Bayer Tapestry and occurs as part of the tapestry's narrative of preparations for the Battle of Hastings. After the Norman army are shown landing on the coast of Sussex, we see them gathering provisions and making fortifications, while hearing news of Harold Godwinson's activities. Among these military scenes, there is this unexplained image, a woman and child fleeing a burning house as it is set alight by Norman soldiers. Their diminutive size compared to the men emphasises their vulnerability. We do not know if this depicts a real incident, and if so, what might have happened. The caption which accompanies the image only notes, hic domus incenditor, here a house is burned, no mention of the woman and child. It has been suggested that these figures may represent specific people, perhaps members of King Harold's family, who have been targeted by Norman soldiers as a provocation to the English king. But it is also possible, perhaps more likely, that in the eyes of the designer of the tapestry and the English women who probably embroidered it, this woman and child stood for other victims of the war, the anonymous casualties so easily forgotten in histories of battles and conquests. The child fleeing the burning house in Hastings would have been a contemporary of the people whose stories form the subject of this book. Thank you very much, Eleanor. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to, to take, take a few minutes to, to share some of my impressions of, of, of the book and some of the things that it's, it's made me think about more and, and in new ways um, about, about this, this moment in history and the way that it was written about at the time. Eleanor's book looks at some of the, the best documented royal, noble, and, and monastic children of the time. So we often know a lot about them and, and their lives, but that also puts us in a position to see what we don't know about them. And, and what she's really done is, 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 is shown us the, the network and web of, of connections and relationships that they formed along, along the way. So the, the, the scope of the book Reaches, reaches widely across Europe um, and even even Western Asia, and although the although the 
the title and the subject might think might make us think that we could class this as a sort of history of of childhood book or a way of looking at youth in the past. I think what's really interesting about it is that it's not limited to that to that view, and we see cases where these um, these youth actions were restricted, where they were oppressed, but also where they're able to to take advantage of of exile and to forge new new new, new relationships. And we can even see how they ended up founding some new new families and dynasties of their own in, in other parts of, of Europe. So it's very much not a story that's that's only about England, but about how the the implications of of conquests are are felt in waves throughout a great a great distance. Um, there, there, there are three three brief brief areas that I just like like to mention that that really stood out to me about the book. And one one of which one of which is the the close connection that Eleanor maintains between the people, these 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 last um, last children of Anglo-Saxon England, and the the stories that were that were written about them, and and through that she pays very close attention to language and wording, both in in the words that that she that 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 she uses and in picking them out in in the medieval sources. So, for example, she she points out that um, Danish names were were used a lot in in Anglo Anglo Danish England. So, King King Harold of the Godwin family is is really part of a family that was important because of its Scandinavian connections, and it was through strengthening those connections that actually some of some of that family found new lives and new way forward after the Norman conquest. There's also a point in the book where, where Eleanor is looking at the sort of fairly dry Anglo-Saxon chronicle account is usually just, just, just about the events. But when she's looking at the, the English pseudo hero, Harroward the Wake, she notices one word that suggests that the chronicler really thinks that he was acting worthily. So being able to do this close reading and kind of pick out that that word might not be significant in a romance if, if everything everyone does is, is, is worthy. But for a chronicler who's not given to, to using adverbs and to giving an opinion, we can sometimes see little glimmers of ideas about how someone was regarded who was putting up a resistance to, to, those, to those in power. The, the, there, there's some other interesting cases of, of, of word choice and consistency that, that Eleanor, Eleanor notices that I think is, is particularly interesting around ideas about gender. So in some of these chronicles, there are often the same phrases used about royal men and royal women, often referring either to the, the quality of their action or in particular that they came from noble blood and royal blood. And she shows that there was, there was interest even in the Norman regime in maintaining connections with the old English House of Wessex, there were there was always attention paid to where to where these where these daughters were, and it's 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 quite interesting to think about how this is also the the presence of women as well as men from the previous royal family was a matter of potential fear and concern for the new Norman rulers and lords. The, the, the story of Margaret of Scotland is, is a particularly fascinating one in this book, who was of the House of Wessex but, but married the King of Scotland and was, was the sister of the real English heir, Edgar, who by all accounts seems like he was trying to actually claim his throne for a long time and ended up going, going abroad as, as well. He was quite, quite a well-traveled person. But I think I think even now, in the way that the Norman Conquest is taught in schools, you often hear about Edgar as as the one who who wasn't really a contender. It was all between Harold and William. But by by showing us that children might have been young, but that people at the time were thinking about them as 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 those ones who not only had the capacity to act, but were likely to become even stronger than they themselves in the future. The case, the case of Waltheof is, is also a really interesting one, um, which, which Eleanor discusses. 
Walthiaf was an English noble and there was quite a scandal because he was beheaded for treachery even though he'd been married into a, a Norman family. One of the things Eleanor shows though is that the, the arguments about whether this was just or unjust and the stories that rose up about Walthiaf as a, a saint or a hero didn't split necessarily on English and Norman lines. There were the questions about how people viewed his personality, how they viewed William, how important he was in a particular local region where, where he would have been a name on, on the lips of, of, of anyone at the time. So I think there's this fa fascinating connection between being able to, to look at the people at the time, but also to see what we can learn about the experience of conquest through understanding how and why these people, these, these, these youths were, were written about. The, the, the second thing that I'd like, I'd like to mention is, is also about this theme about responses to men and, and women and royalty. I think one of, the, one of the most interesting stories for me in the book was in the, the chapter about what happened to, to Harold's family. And, and we, the, there's an account which which Eleanor discusses in, in in the book something something for all of you to 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 look forward to reading, where there's there, there's a discussion about the possibility that that Harold's mother, um, Githa, was helping to stage uh, a, an outpost of resistance in 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 Exeter. There's some discussion amongst the chronicles that that she and some other nobles gathered together and, and, and as far as we can tell from the military side, this was the first active organized rebellion after the Norman conquest. But soon after that, she and a number of other women took flight to a, uh, a remote rocky island off the coast and then ultimately made their way to Europe. I think that this shows something about how women and men could plan and act together, but there were some realities about the experience of women and they, they had a sense of what, what they might have been able to expect as far as treatment from the hands of the Normans if this rebellion were not successful. And Eleanor brings some, uh, some, some very, very valuable attention to, to scenes like this and the sense about pointing out not just that these are events and famous people mentioned in Chronicles, but that these might have been the last moments that some of these people in the families would have actually seen each other. This, this event, the, the decision of some of these women to basically go, go into exile, Eleanor also points out is, is, is perhaps a response to the coronation of William the Conqueror's wife, Matilda of Flanders. So she was crowned after him basically as, as the Queen of England and that this supplanting of previous women by a conqueror's wife was something that generated a response and that was fascinating to me because it also resonated with another argument that a colleague of mine has made about the effect of Matilda's coronation, that basically she would have been highly visibly pregnant at the time too with the future Henry I. Now, of course, no one knew at that time that this unborn child would become king, but it was quite significant because this was a public display of the conquering queen's fertility. This would be the first child born to a reigning king and a reigning queen. So even though they already had some sons, this was, this was going to be a new child to supplant other reigning children. My, my colleague thinks that, that this moment and this ceremony might actually have stimulated some of the rebellion in the North, which again, the members of the House of Wessex and their Scottish allies were involved in as well as English nobles. So there are all of these connections, but, but that's another case where I think you can see at the time, it's, it's not just a case of um, men like William the Conqueror doing battle and, and winning victories at Hastings. The process of conquest was a longer thing that involved displacing women and um, cases in which conquerors as well were fearful about the, the futures of the children from the previous regime and were trying to replace things with the next generation. So the, the, the final point I'd like to make is that, some, is, is, is that I think that, I was thinking about how to, how to describe Eleanor's book, and I like the way that it shows us a vision of the past that's, that's 
something I, I would call li lifespan memory. There have been a lot of studies about the Norman Conquest that look at things in terms of generational memory, as though different generations respond in distinct ways, that we can see these large processes, and there's evidence for that. There's also discussions about childhood memory. One of the things Eleanor talks about is the sense of, is that some historians have argued that a lot of these people felt nostalgic about their childhood. But what she shows it's not is that nostalgia for, the, for childhood isn't just something that's in the past. And she shows the continuity of experience that, that someone might, like a, a monk in Canterbury, might remember his childhood, but also be continuing to think with and act, act on it and not just think of it as something lost in the past to be regretted. So, so they were, it's, it's not only that these were children and then they grew up and became adults, but I think um, sort of like some people say now, you, you don't really grow older, you just add years on. So, so you're still, if you're 50, you're still also 10 and you're still also 15 as well. And this sensitivity to lifespan and how people might have been feeling and thinking at different times, I think is, is an important voice and way of thinking about this moment of conquest and disruption in England's history. So thank you very much, Eleanor. Thank you. Mm. Okay. The, I'll now turn over to, to Michael to, to, to give a response to Eleanor's book as well. Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, that's also lots of interesting things to think about that you've already mentioned. I think, I mean, coming from a sort of the English perspective of things um, and sort of less the historical perspective of things, although I also Dublin history writing a lot. Um, it's quite striking when you come to this book, having focused a lot on rewriting and you know, retelling of stories about these very real people. And I think what I really appreciated about the book is that you can sort of follow these stories as they develop and suddenly accrue new elements and get to become these really remarkably literary retellings of lives that you really had no idea would have, would have been shaped like that in later memory. Um, I think it's sort of a, a very interesting bridge between history writing and then story writing as it sort of develops that you can sort of see very much in action over as you said, I mean, in, over, the, the, over, over a lifetime already, and in people's lifetime, uh, lifetimes. Um, I mean, this sort of, the way that certain characters like Herod, who later becomes known as Herod the Wake, and this sort of becomes the stereotypical rebel, and I think you mentioned him as a sort of um, slightly Robin Hood-like figure, uh, figure in some ways. Um, and it sort of becomes the focus of stories of bands of outlaws and um, sort of clever ways of outwitting his enemies that make him seem like this plucky little, um, the, 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 the plucky fighter in, 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 in many ways. And then various endings to his story, and some endings he is uh, either killed, or in other ways he is then finally makes peace with the Normans and settles down to a, a peaceful life. Um, and as you sort of read further and, and these stories accrue, you can see whatever picture we had of, say, the Herod as one of the last children of Anglo-Saxon England disappear into the background and we get to the picture of Herobot as the rebel or the wake and we sort of see whatever later histories have overlaid over this lost childhood, if we want to say it that way. I mean, there's, the same sort of thing happens with Margaret of Scotland where, I mean, this is where uh, you do very sort of clearly mention that, you know, um, she's then venerated as a saint and you write, um, the, the, there's a saint's life written about her and obviously saints' lives have very clear structures that tend to be applied not to express sort of the individual life of a saint, but to express that they are generally like other saints, so that you sort of lose your individuality in becoming a saint because you have to be like all these other saints at the same time. Um, and so this is one way where this is very clearly in action, sort of her story becomes eclipsed by her sanctity as sort of a more important part of her memory at, this, at that stage. But it also happens earlier in the, the, the sections you, you analyze of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle that are quite poetic, you sort of realize um, that tend not to be seen as poetry much because um, when you read the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle for historiographical material, you don't necessarily want to read you know, for poetry. Uh, but if you do both as you do, you sort of see how these poetic structures overlay her life again and sort of once more she, she displays into the background. There's a very strong sort of poignancy to that, I think. Um, 
and the, the way you said it, also a saint's life uh, is written to sort of express a cultural harmony that exists with post-conquest society. Um, but you can see in the way that her struggles, let's say, in her youth disappear in that life, um, as they do for the man who wrote that life, who was a child at the same time, um, they disappear, and that is in some ways the price of harmony, uh, which, again, is very quite impactful reading there. And on the other side, you have the story of the descendants or the family of King Harold, who have no stories told about them, except for Harold himself later on, um, but who are memorialized in, say, Norse genealogies for their value as sort of relations of kings. But again, you see this sort of utility coming in. Um, and when they have no utility in England, then there are no stories about them. And once more, the childhood sort of is lost in that case. I think this is why I really found the last chapter to be the most interesting. Um, so moving on past sort of Valfeof, who also has his run-ins with various highly stylized forms of poetry that uh, cast him in sort of later on Norse receptions of his story. Past Valfeof, we move on to Erdmer of Canterbury, uh, a monk who then later writes histories himself, but who's also born in 1050 and so falls within this sort of well, around 1050, and who falls into this bracket of the last children of Anglo-Saxon England, and so whose, whose life is very much disrupted by the conquest and the burning down of Canterbury Cathedral. Um, and it's a picture I think you don't often see, because you, you, you I mean, at least in, um, with a lot of texts written around that period, um, when I studied them, you don't tend to question all too much the experiences of the authors, especially if they've written, if, if, if these experiences have happened decades before the authors actually produce the, te the text that we study. But again, in this case, you have the clear disruption in his life that then, in some ways, is counteracted by his literary activity later on. Uh, the very fact that sort of he can assert his own memory of things and continue his own production of things. This is the moment, I think, where it sort of most clearly comes out that the continuity that we have in text and, 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 and storytelling and history telling at the time um, is, in a way, a direct, not just a result, but sort of comes with the disruption of the conquest and coming out of the disruption then remedies it in the texts that we read. I think this was sort of the, 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 where I felt the book came together in many interesting ways to see the person behind the writing who falls in very much the same categories but then explains a lot of the dynamics going on in the reinterpretation and constant reinterpretation and rewriting of all of these lives. Thank you. So it's now an, an opportunity for Eleanor to, to share any, any, any thoughts that she has about the book, the writing of the book, and any of the, any of the thoughts that have come up, come up so far. Thank you. Thank you both for your very uh, thoughtful responses to the book. Um, I think one of the things that uh, perhaps both your responses had in common and what you were saying, Michael, um, about the kind of patterns of hagiography um, or romance or so on, and touches on um, your first point, Emily, about the, the kind of balance I was trying to strike in the book between the actual lives of these people about whom we do, you know, they're quite well told stories, aren't they, in uh, modern historiography, but then also the sense of how those stories were told in the Middle Ages, um, both at the time or, or slightly afterwards. Um, and I suppose the, the genesis of the book was really a kind of sense of wanting to write a group biography of this generation, who in one sense, it's a slight, I don't want to say it's an artificial category, but I mean, the last children, it's, it's kind of a poetic way of imagining them, I suppose, but it's, it is what they have in common, that sense that they fall into um, this kind of generational gap in a way. Um, and. And so sort of struggling with the question of how far you can write a biography of medieval people, subjects, when um, there is, you know, gaps in the sources and often, of course, particularly um, uh, the sense that even the sources that we do have are very much shaped by established literary patterns. Um, and so I was kind of interested in the fact that at the sort of at the core of the book are medieval biographies themselves. So either Saints' Lives or uh, the romance told about Harrow of the Wake. Um, in, and in those kinds of, in those types of texts, which um, represent important literary cultural changes that are coming in as a result of the conquest, you are getting narratives of these individual lives from, in a sense, from beginning to end, including, of course, the experience of the conquest, but then um, quite a lot more as well. Um, and so sort of trying to understand those texts as, as kind of a, as biography, as, as attempts to create narratives about 
um, that experience of change, that experience of, of, um, of conquest, I suppose, um, but then also observing the places where those narratives were not written, you know, stories that were told and stories that were not told um, was, was kind of what I was seeking to do, I suppose. I think at, at, at this point, we will have, have a bit of discussion amongst ourselves for probably about, about five minutes, and then we'll open the floor to, to, to questions from you to conclude it at 1.50. I mean, I think, so uh, an, another thing that occurred to me that I think is, is important and interesting about the book too is, is the sense throughout that the, the Norman conquest itself may have been a dramatic rupture, but it also wasn't the first conquest of England in the 11th century. And so, I mean, one of the things you do in, in, in the book that, that I thought was, was interesting and kind of made historical comparisons as, as, well, in, as well as giving us more of a sense of the 11th century was seeing how the, the same kinds of displacements, uncertainties, exile had happened in England in the same century already because of the Danish conquest of England and the the fleeing of, of the English heirs to Normandy. I mean, indeed, it was their presence in, in Normandy that also started to help encourage the Normans to think, oh, well, may, maybe we'd, we'd like to come conquer too. But but the sense that the each each of the youths talked about in the book had, had their own individual story and set set of interesting and challenging sources around them but that in some ways their experiences weren't unique in the experience of, of, of England in, in the 11th century. Yeah. I think that's actually a really important, interesting point because I thought, I mean, I mentioned this before, um, I really enjoy the very straightforward way of writing about all of these stories and the way you can see things develop. And that makes it also quite easy to draw comparisons even further. Uh, between the sort of situations that might fit similar patterns. And I was in some ways reminded of William Marshall, uh, who later on, so he's a child during the uh, Civil War or the anarchy in England in the sort of mid 12th century. Um, and you have the same, he's, his life is then um, recorded in a humongous uh, biography, actually Norman verse biography of the early 13th century, I believe. But there you also have this idea of his childhood then being taken to fit in some various courtly tropes and, and, and themes. And essentially, again, it disappears behind very literary treatments that are clearly you know, meant as such. Um, but this is sort of what, what, what I find fascinating is that in, in some ways, as you say, I mean, the, the conquest is a disruption, but it seems to mark a pattern for a lot of similar disruptions that are papered over um, or lettered over. Uh, with various other histories. I think what I find interesting about um, that question of, you know, this is the second conquest, it's not the, not a unique experience in that sense, um, is that in, in one way the connections are very strong and you can trace, uh, both, I mean, particularly in the case of these individual lives, you can trace their, you know, the, the origins of a lot of what happened to them back to the, to the Danish conquest, but that actually the kinds of writing about those two conquests are very different. The kinds of stories that they generate in this respect um, are quite different because I don't think there is anything really comparable to the kinds of stories you're, I was able to tell in this book for anyone who lived through the events of 1016. So either it was, you know, there wasn't a, a general sense of it as rupture and disruption. And I mean, of, of course it, it was in some sense just as much a disruption, but uh, it didn't generate that kind of narrative. Um, and also, of course, you don't have things like, you know, a martyr kind of stories um, uh, work in different ways or rebel stories work in different ways. So I think the the kind of literary results of the two conquests are, are interestingly different. Yeah. And um, the after the after conquests, I mean, I, I, I think that these are I think the approach you've taken here, it's one, it's one I'd like to see, see how far it could be carried out about other, other conquests or experience of, experiences of displacement in, in the Middle Ages, because this, your, your book catches the, catches writing at a moment when there was a, a flourishing of Latin historical writing and the birth of romance and an interest in interiority and a, a wider phenomenon sometimes called called the 12th century renaissance so it's I mean sometimes it's 
things happening outside of conquest that can that can give us this extra win window into how some people at least were thinking and feeling about it. The the case of William Marshall, Michael, Michael, and the life of William Marshall, I think, is also a particularly interesting one for thinking about writing about children and tensions that people felt in the Middle Ages. You you probably rem remember the the figures better than I, but I know there's there's a kind of set piece of th of three cases where there's a, a a siege and a battle going on, and a child keeps mistaking a, a weapon of war for a toy. And, 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 and the sort of feeling of sadness about that actually makes the person fighting the battle desist, at least for a little while, but then, of course, not, not for very long. And I guess that, that's a very literary setup, uh, stylized in, 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 in groups of threes. But, but I think it also shows this tension of pe people thought that children were people for whom one should be, should be sympathetic, but how long could it actually distract people from the business of war if if they thought they had they had something to gain from it what was 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 there one particular moment in in any of these narratives that 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 you would say was the the stimulus to to make you write write this book it's a good question i think it, uh, in some ways actually the stimulus comes from the chapter which in a way doesn't fit quite as well with the others which is the last chapter um about edma edma whatever uh, the mark of canterbury um because we don't have a narrative of his life what we have are the narratives he wrote of other people's lives um but there is a very strong sense from his works of of, of, of exactly what you were talking about in your response there of a sort of continuing a life cycle or the course of, of someone's life and how they're perceptions of their own experiences and the people around them can kind of develop over time. That very self-conscious sense he has of being a witness to history, like he really knows that he's witnessing history and writing about it and, um, and perhaps that his writings will influence how other people remember this period that he's experienced. And that sense that um, I find quite powerful in his works of the fact he was, I suppose, probably one of the youngest of these children and very much a child. So he really was a child in the, in the way that, um, say, the children of Harold Godwinson are, you know, they're in their teens, so they're really kind of on the border of childhood and, and adulthood. But the memories of someone who experiences a, a very dramatic event at six or seven, those memories must have actually been very hazy. And yet he keeps returning to them, gives them a kind of concrete form um, and allows them to shape his historical writing and the way that he presents um, stories of pre-conquest England. Um, and uh, you were talking about the idea that it's more than nostalgia, and I think that's very important because it clearly is something that has a deep personal resonance, but it's part of a, a process of, of coming to understand the contemporary events to which he's also a witness and, and, and to kind of make sense of them and to connect memories of that rather distant and, and I suppose receding world with the more present events of the of the, the, uh, the current, you know, his current experience. Right. Thank you very much. I think at, at, at this point, for the last few minutes, we'll turn it over to, to you for questions. Questions for Eleanor particularly encouraged. This is your chance to hear hear from the author herself, but questions to the panel also welcome. So any any thoughts from No, I think you can get a, well, it varies how much you can get a sense of them as individuals, really, because the nature of the sources varies. I mean, as I was just saying, I I, I find because um, Edmund of Canterbury is writing himself, you know, we have his own voice and the others are being written about. Um, there is, I, I feel quite, I feel quite fond of him. I feel a strong <laughs> identification with him. Might as well say that. Um, but I'm also uh, uh, very interested in the story of Margaret of Scotland, um, and I found that quite. I mean, the Anglo-Saxon um, chronicle passage that, that Michael alluded to is very moving in its presentation of her story. Uh, how far that reflects her own experience is a difficult question. It's the chronicler's interpretation of of the situation she was in. But that sense of um, the vulnerability of her and her family as essentially refugees in the Scottish court and then kind of almost being, um, well, coerced is how the Chronicle presents it, uh, into marriage with the Scottish king. Um, there's something very interesting about what happened to her and then how her her life and uh, kind of becomes a success story, I think. And it's not only how other people are telling it, but there must be something about her own behaviour or her conduct, which is allowing that way of telling the story to, to, to come through. So, um, I think her story was one that particularly uh, stuck with me.
Well, it's a it's a complex picture, really. So, um, I mean, you can certainly see. I wouldn't want to downplay the extent to which some of them were victims, as I was, you know, reading um, in that passage about the fear of violence and and so on. Um, but uh, there's also a sense, I suppose, in which some of them um, are able to. Uh, use the fact, I mean Margaret is an example of this perhaps, to use the fact that they are now the surviving representatives of a valuable line of inheritance, a genetic line of inheritance that can connect um, or can offer something to uh, to the Norman conquerors. Um, and one thing that is kind of interesting about uh, some of these stories is that um, female descendants, so not in this generation of children but in the next generation, uh, it's often the female descendants who are sort of controlling the ways that the stories of these English ancestors are told. So Waltheof's daughter, for instance, um, seems to be quite influential in how his her father's memory is uh, is remembered. And it also with Margaret of Scotland, her daughter who marries Henry I, the new child of the, <laughs> the generation, um, uh, is, is the patron of the life of, of her mother that's written. So I think there is a sense of, of women kind of uh, taking an active role in the commemoration of this generation um, and those experiences too, so thank you. Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the interesting aspects of some of these texts is that they, in fact, pay very little attention to the experience of childhood. Um, so, uh, the, you know, the, 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 um, in the saints' lives, for instance, of course, there, there are sort of stories told about the childhood, I mean, in the case of Margaret, for instance, but they're not, it's not dwelled on, it's not really given much, much um, sort of attention. And, um, I mean, I was kind of trying to be careful about how I was using the term children because of course it's a, um, in some sense it's kind of, you know, our modern idea of what children or adolescents are is not at all kind of um, reflected in the, uh, the sources really. Um, uh, but there is a sense I think in some of them, say in um, the Heroewood stories, about a process of ma maturity. So it's not so much about growing from childhood to adulthood, but perhaps from adolescence to adulthood. Um, I think that's that's how I that's how I justified including Heroin in this book, at least in that I think the the Gesta Herwadi um, allows for some sense of of that progression to to adulthood. Sense. Yeah, well, exactly. So and, and he grows from that, you know, uh, youthful tr troublemaking and adventuring to a more settled kind of maturity towards the end of the text. I think it's, it's as I would see it, it's all closer to the romance model, really, um, in that it's a, well, partly it's reflecting probably what actually happened. So there was a limited amount of, of room that the, uh, the, 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 the uh, writer had to play with that in that he really was um, exiled uh, or you know, had forced to leave uh, his home for whatever reason. Um, I don't. I wouldn't see that aspect of the story as being heavily influenced by that kind of Scandinavian pattern of the, you know, the, the uh, troublemaking child who grows up into a hero, and more a sense of this is what drives him away from his home. That's the kind of um, movement into exile, into sort of distance from which he can return and kind of find his place as his father's heir, essentially. Right. Well, as we're just approaching one one fifty, we'll we'll conclude the formal proceedings there. But uh, before, before we do, please join me in thanking my fellow panelists, Michael, and of course, Eleanor, for her book, Concord. Thank you.